very interested in thinking and talking about who, what speaker we might get next and uh, how that might happen. Um, and certainly, it, it's the wonderful thing about it is it's very inexpensive to get speakers right now. <laughs> yes, selling people, sending people around the world is really difficult. So for yeah. some years, we're going to do it this way, I guess. Yeah, yeah. and maybe uh, if, if we can get great people to speak to students all in many different countries, then that's even better than them just coming to one city and speaking. Plus, Henry uh, uh, recorded it and posted it to YouTube, which is wonderful. <laughs> And, and Joanne, at the end of our session, we're going to invite um, your students to attend um, a, set, a global lecture series that we're doing. We're hosting a mass timber lecture at the end of the month, and we'll give you that information as well. Sounds great. Sounds great. Because, yeah, my students are also getting used to this online thing. So it's good to get different stimulus, not only me lecturing. So I think it's also great to see different things. So. I think it's great that you explain to them this opportunity. Sure. And, and also, if there's a, uh, an architect in South Korea uh, that might be ideal for speaking to students around the world, we would you know, be happy to talk with you about hosting them. Yes, I think it's a good opportunity, right? So maybe yeah. after the lecture, online and by email, we can see how we can keep going. And Henry, I'll just let you know, I, I may be dipping in and out because I've got guests coming over to this evening. So um, if, if, if you're looking for me at any point in the, the activities, <laughs> I, I may or may not be in. So um, I'll just give you, warn you of that in advance. Joanne, you, you, today, uh, tomorrow is actually a holiday in Canada. So it's a long oh. time so people have, um, it, we're still kind of in, in isolation, but um, people have, uh, probably some activities planned for the weekend. <laughs> okay, so I, we, I, when we choose this day, I had no idea, right? This situation, how it's... Right. And also it's Sunday night, right? In Canada right now? Sunday night. So it's a little bit more tricky. Students are on Monday morning mood, so <laughs> it's a little bit different. Good morning, everyone. Guys, Canada and Korea, if you want to open the camera so we see your face, it's also great. So maybe we can begin, Henry, correct? Yep. Okay, I'm gonna share a little bit my screen one second. I want to say welcome to everyone. Welcome to the guest lecture. I think it's a great opportunity for our students, both in Korea and Canada to listen to different approach to green building and design. From the big question, why we need a uh, green building? Why, what's the circumstance to how to solve it? So let me introduce myself for the guys who don't know me. I, my name is Joan Canet, I'm an architect from Barcelona. I've been practicing in Europe, China for five years and in Korea. And I'm currently assistant professor at Kemin University. So first, I want to say thank you for joining us today to the faculty dean. Dr. Douglas MacLeod, he was here talking right now, as well as our guest lecturers today. They are already here, Henry Tsang and Trevor Butler. So they're going to introduce themselves probably, but firstly, let me tell who they are. Henry is an architect, a researcher, and an educator. And he's an assistant professor at Athabasca University, Center for Architecture. He used to work in the Japanese mega firm Nico, Nihon Sekei, which is a really, really huge company. So he has lots of experience in teaching, but also in practical world. He's been practicing and teaching in Canada, Japan, and China, Indonesia, and Korea. So his research interests, both in papers and lectures, have been in green, sustainable, resilient, and healthy design. So I think it fits really our theme for our green building. In fact, he was teaching, he was a professor at Kemin University for four years and he developed the original version of this green building course. So I think it's very interesting that he's back to teach to Kemin, even if it's through Zoom. That's the way it is. Hopefully in the future, he can come back to Korea and we can host him in our department. And he's gonna be speaking. Also Trevor, he's also here in the camera. Trevor is an engineer and assistant professor at 
Atabasca University in the same center as Henry. He's principal of the firm Archineers and he's a qualified as both civil and mechanical engineer. He has lots and lots of experience and that's also a good thing to, to listen to, right? Not only from an academical point of view, but also practical point of view. And I think that's it. I think it's great to have you guys here through Zoom. So maybe you can begin. They're gonna lecture. They're gonna introduce some program later on for more online lectures. You can guys join us. And of course, if there's any question, you are welcome to ask at the end of the session. And that's it. Henry, I let you speak, okay? Thank you very much for listening. Henry, I cannot hear you. Mike. Okay, let me just uh, turn on my slideshow now. So do you see my slides? Yep. Okay. Uh, so hello everyone. Um, Oren Manida, <laughs> long time no see for those who know me uh, from Kemyong University. Uh, as Joanne had mentioned, I was a professor at Kemyong for four years from 2005 until uh, last uh, March. And so it's really nice to be back, uh, kind of. <laughs> Although this is through a kind of funny situation, uh, I'm coming back to Kemyong. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Henry Tang. I'm an architect and assistant professor at uh, Kemio, uh, Athabasca University right now in Canada. And uh, previously uh, an assistant professor at the College of Architecture at Kemyong. And also um, some of my relevant experience related to green building is that I was also an executive member of the well building standards at the uh, Korean Green Building Council and also an architect at Nihong Seke in Japan for about 10 years. Um, my education was mo mostly in Canada and at McGill University in architecture and then at the University of Tokyo in Japan. Um, I'm going to also introduce my colleague, uh, Trevor Butler, who will be also speaking to you today. Trevor, would you like to say a couple of words? Yes, thank you, Henry. Kamsa uh, Hamnida, everybody, for having us today. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you all. Um, thank you, Joanne, for the invitation. Uh, I'm an assistant professor with Henry at Athabasca University. I'm a professional practicing engineer, um, have been for over 25 years through Arcaneers. Uh, my connection with Canada began through Dalhousie University, which is on the East Coast, quite close to New York City. Uh, and I'm creative director of Matchbox Energy, which I'll explain a little bit in the talk, and technology innovations such as EarthTube systems. I'm currently studying my PhD from my, my home country of uh, of England, and um, that's where I studied my undergrad degrees. Thank you, Henry. So just a couple of words on uh, the university we teach at. Uh, Athabasca University is located in Athabasca in the province of Alberta in Canada, which is kind of like in the middle um, north part of Canada. It's a, a very cold uh, city. And, um, but the university that we teach in Athabasca University is also Canada's online open university, which means that the whole program that we teach architecture in right now is an online university. All of our courses are through the internet. Um, so if you're interested in looking at our website, uh, this is the one you can just Google uh, our page and then you will also find all of our courses here. Um, and if you're interested to take any courses with us, um, all of our courses are online again. So um, uh, the same way that we teach, uh, we're giving this lecture, we also do studios and all of our courses, lectures online. 
So let's start the, the slideshow. Um, you will find that some of my slides still have some Korean in it because a lot of these slides were from my course that I taught at Kaemyung University. So I translated some of my slides for you. Um, so some of them still have the Korean subtitles. And of course, if we talk about green buildings, green building is very important because of course, of the situation that we're in um, and the place that we live on earth. Um, I always say that green building is kind of like designing a really, really big, not just a house or a small building, but we really have to think about the whole planet and the project of redesigning uh, a better uh, place to live on earth. So of course, if we're talking about green building, you have to understand that the situation of uh, the planet is currently we have a very serious problem of global warming. And because of global warming on Earth, the climate has been changing uh, drastically. We have been seeing a lot more natural disasters. And because of that, we have to um, design buildings that are more efficient in terms of energy use and also a lot more uh, connected to the ecosystem and the natural environment. So looking at some data related to the United Nations, UN um, has modeled um, what uh, is currently our temperature on Earth. Um, and the consensus is that if the temperature on the planet is increased by two degrees, you see here, um, here is where we are today. And from here, what we decide to do is very important because if we go beyond the two degrees, our planet can keep on increasing in temperature um, very, very uh, much uh, beyond the normal temperature of the planet. And beyond this point, it becomes very hard to control. And we don't know what's going to happen if we don't control um, our CO2 emissions today, um, because we, we will likely see more uh, natural disasters and then even uh, a situation where we are uh, harder to control and harder to design for as architects. So it's very important that we know this and that we start to do something today and to design greener and more efficient, uh, sustainable buildings. So here, obviously we don't have another planet. Obviously if it was an easy solution is that we just move to Mars or another planet but currently we don't have that option. And of course, a lot of you know in 2015, uh, what was the Paris Agreement uh, in, uh, that was agreed in 2015. Um, all of you of course know uh, Chairman Ban Ki-moon who was the instigator of this uh, agreement across the world, but not many of you actually know what was agreed during that time. So at, in 2015 at the Paris Agreement, um, the United Nations had agreed to limit global warming to two degrees like we showed in the graph. And of course, two, de two degrees is almost like a limit and if possible, we want to control it under 1.5 degrees to attain net zero energy by 2030. So we want to control buildings to a net zero um, self-sustainable um, uh, level to increase government and major construction firms leadership and to improve interaction among green building councils. So for example, in Canada or in Korea, can our um, green building councils develop more of a co cooperation? I think these kind of talks that we're having today is very important to kind of start these conversations about how each country is dealing with um, their uh, design and, and how they're adapting to the situation. 
and then encourage advocacy and training initiatives. So teaching you guys, um, uh, young architects, about what we know and how to deal and how to design green buildings is, of course, very, very important. With the 2015 Paris Agreement, there were also 17 sustainable development goals that were established. And I'm not going to go through this very um, in detail, but you would see that at least six of them have to do directly to um, how we design. For example, number three, good health and well being. How can we design to make people healthier? Um, number 11, sustainable cities and communities. Um, number 13, climate action. All of these are directly or indirectly related to green building design. So you can see how important green building design is related to um, achieving su global sustainability. So today's talk is really about um, the role of the architect and the role of the engineer. Um, me and Trevor, we really wanted to talk to you about me as an architect, Trevor as a uh, Trevor as an engineer. You know, me as an architect who lo who loves engineering, and Trevor as an engineer who loves architecture. How we can actually work together to make better uh, buildings and design more efficient buildings. This is a funny cartoon that I, I like to show. It says, "It's my design unless it's fall down. Then it's yours." So I think the traditional um, roles of architect and engineer was very distinct. Architect design gives the plans to the engineer and engineer has to find a way to solve the mechanical problem or the structural problem, uh, electrical problem. But in many ways, this is the type of conversation that we want to change and make it more of a dialogue. We don't want it just to be architect first and then engineer second. So here, um, if some of you, you might know uh, who Buckminster Fuller is, uh, an architect and theorist who lived uh, about uh, uh, in, in, in the 1950s mostly. Um, he was an architect that was very interested in sustainability. And even at that time, green building as a term did not really exist. You know, this was very, very early in the understanding of green building. Um, this is an architect who was very fascinated in engineering and developing actual um, systems um, related to uh, how to, he was really imagining about what the world could be in a situation where there was a lot of pollution and the, the very bad environment. And also this was right after the war. So he was imagining, well, how can I design a, a world where um, resources and um, everything related to uh, the environment was in a, a very difficult situation and how can, you, how can as an architect, we design um, a place to live. So for example, in here, you see this dome, right? The dome was imagined to be, let's say if you had a situation where the environment and the air outside was very polluted, well, is there a structure that we can design to protect your building or protect a city? So this is called the geodesic dome. On the right, you see a design of a, um, an early design of a off the grid house. So how can you design a house that, um, that, that produces its own energy and produces, um, it, it, uh, renews its own water and, and renews all of its resources? So th this is what many consider maybe a first, um, I, I call them an archineer, a, a marriage between an architect and an engineer. But the philosophy here is that in the 1950s until recently, um, design of buildings was mostly architecture first and then engineering second. And 
here we on the right you see um, the Seagrin building designed by Mies van der Rohe. He designed many buildings with a lot of a lot of glass and um, that we consider today to be a very inefficient um, way of developing an envelope of a building. And on the left, you see that this is New York um, recently banned uh, glass skyscrapers uh, last year. So no more glass skyscrapers because it's too much, um, it's too much of an inefficient uh, membrane of a building and you have too much heat loss and too much heat gain and developing a facade like that was not sustainable. So looking back at history, you see a lot of um, examples of green buildings because I believe that green buildings don't have to be very high tech. Even very low tech, very um, simple buildings can be very good green buildings. And here you see an example of um, too low architecture in China. And why this why this building is a green building is that this building has been there for um, 2000 or more years and people are still living in them. And if I show you a, a section of this building, um, you see that it's a very high density residential building. In the middle, it's a very uh, large courtyard, but the section, the wall is made of uh, rammed earth, which is a very good material to conserve energy and um, keep the building warm. But also you see a lot of um, openings that create a nice uh, natural ventilation that brings um, natural uh, winds into the building. And if you look at new buildings today, for example, this is the Apple Park, the Apple headquarter in USA, you see that it's actually a very similar design and uses a, a lot of the same um, understanding of natural ventilation and also um, the, the use of a ring to develop this, um, this design by Norman Foster. Green buildings um, techniques can be found in Korean Hanok architecture as well. Uh, when I was in Korea, I was always very fascinated by um, the, the ways Korean architecture tried to use, uh, channel the heat um, to keep buildings warm. For example, this is an, a traditional ondo structure um, that uses the heat that you use for cooking and use a channeling system underneath the building. Um, the gundo is actually a uh, support that are made of stone that retains heat and keeps the building warm. And you can see this channeling system and a chimney on the right that brings the smoke out uh, on the other side. So what I'm trying to show you is that green building techniques can be very simple if you understand the physics and the chemistry behind um, how heat works or how water works and how uh, waste is managed. Um, here I show you an example of a natural green building uh, in the sense that nature can also be a very good example of where you can find inspiration for green buildings. On the right you see a termite mound, so um, like little ants that made a, a mountain uh, here. And on the left you see an example of a building that was inspired by it. And actually I have a very short video to show you, to explain to you how this actually works. So I'm going to play that. This is a termite mound. Millions of termites live inside these structures, some of which stretch an astonishing 30 feet high. Although these termite skyscrapers may look solid from the outside, they are actually covered in tiny holes that allow air to pass through freely. Like a giant lung, the structure inhales and exhales as temperatures rise and fall throughout the day. This termite ventilation inspired Pierce to use an approach known as biomimicry, imitating the ingenuity found in nature to solve human problems. Meet the Eastgate Center. The building is made from concrete slabs and brick. Just like the soil inside a termite mound, these materials have a high thermal mass, which means they can absorb a lot of heat without really changing temperature. 
The exterior of the building is prickly, like a cactus. By increasing the amount of surface area, heat loss is improved at night while heat gain is reduced during the day. Inside the building, low power fans pull in cool night air from outside and disperse it throughout the seven floors. The concrete blocks absorb the cold, insulating the building and chilling the circulating air. When the morning comes and temperatures rise, warm air is vented up through the ceiling and released by the chimneys. Thanks to this innovative design, temperatures inside stay at a comfortable 82 degrees during the day and 57 degrees at night. Not to mention, it uses up to 35% less energy than similar buildings in Zimbabwe. Since opening its doors in 1996, Mick Pierce's 90% natural climate control system has made the Eastgate Center a global landmark for sustainability. So, we must ask ourselves, if an architect could design a self-cooling building with termite-inspired climate control, what other innovations could Mother Nature inspire if we just paid closer attention? So with that, you see that I think nature um, has many ways to, many examples we can find where we can use these ideas in our buildings. Um, so coming back to our designs of, of what we do today, um, we're looking at buildings today um, that are highly inefficient because mainly of the fact that we are trying to make them more comfortable for us to live in. And we are trying to create the micro, uh, a kind of micro system inside of buildings. Think about your air conditioning and um, all of the appliances you have in your house. We're just trying to make it more comfortable and all of that we are using in, a, in our buildings obviously requires a lot of energy. Energy, obviously there's different kinds of energies and we're trying to shift away from fossil fuel energies um, and going to uh, using more clean energy. But fossil fuels today is still one of the main um, uh, sources of energy in the world. And because we're using fossil fuels, we are also emitting a lot of greenhouse gases that we need to control. Um, in the U.S. and North America, the uh, building sector, so uh, architecture, uh, is responsible for 40 to 50 percent of uh, energy consumption. So about 40 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions also come from buildings. So that's why it's very important for architects and engineers to think about this problem because we have such a big influence in terms of how much energy and how much greenhouse gas is used um, in the world. So many of you perhaps have um, heard of uh, green building certifications like Nuxek Konchuk Injin, right? Um, in Korea, you have a certification that's called the G seat Green Standard for Energy and Environmental Design. Um, in North America, uh, the main green building certification uh, standard is the LEED system. Uh, but also on the right, you see that orange flower. That one is called the Living Building Challenge, which is so somewhat of a new uh, certification. But we can also kind of put them on a line and say, well, the GC is actually quite easy to achieve in terms of standard. Um, and the living building challenge is one of the most difficult to achieve. That being said, GSEED is a government, Korean government certification. So they made the certification relatively easy so that more architects and engineers can adapt it into their, build, into their buildings. Um, but if you are trying to achieve true sustainability, like really achieve um, uh, global sustainability goals, we really need to m think more in terms of net zero and a living building challenge standard to really achieve um, these global goals. Um, just to give you an idea of what green buildings, um, you know, what it takes to, to achieve a green building, and I'm sure that, Joanne, you probably talk about 
this kind of um, information in your course is that most of the green building certifications will tell you that you need to achieve um, points or achieve different categories of um, prescriptive uh, goals. So most of them obviously will look at um, energy, water, materials, and here you also have um, sustainable sites, location linkages, and innovation, and awareness for education, and indoor environmental quality. But most of the certification systems are quite similar in the categories. And I would say that all of them at least will have the energy one, which is the most important one, um, the water, and the one that's called materials, which is related to waste and how you deal with the waste management of your um, building. And that's uh, including um, the construction of, um, of your building, but also the um, demolition, because demolition waste is uh, one of the largest uh, contributors to waste uh, in, uh, in society. So looking forward, we look, like I said, you know, green building is probably not enough. We need to move forward into um, the net zero uh, standards. And we talked about what is living building. Living building means net zero energy, net zero water, and net zero waste. But also um, there are other um, um, categories within living buildings, but I think if we can achieve net zero energy, net zero waste, and net zero water, um, that's uh, a stepping stone towards um, sustainability. And if we move even further, uh, advance a little bit further, we're also looking at what are smart buildings. And smart buildings is not really a green building, but when we talk about smart building is really how we can use um, data and the internet of things to make our buildings more efficient. So what that means is that, well, if we know how many people is going to use your building at one time, how many cars, how, how much, um, uh, what is the occupancy of your building, um, then we can kind of, we can control the, um, uh, the resources around that. For example, how much energy we use in a room, or can we turn off the lights when nobody is in a room automatically? And then one building is not enough. We really need to look at uh, a city at a, at, at a whole, um, as a whole. Um, so developing green cities is something that you also need to think about is that, well, can we develop not just one building, but one neighborhood or one city? Um, then we can think about a whole system of um, sharing energy, um, transportation that can be more efficient, and, and so on. And beyond that, um, we also talk about what is um, regenerative design, meaning that we are not just looking at um, a product design or an, a building, community design, industrial ecology and urban planning, this keeps on growing. And if we can achieve um, what we talked about earlier in terms of designing the world with the whole, uh, um, a whole system uh, kind of approach, then we would be more closer to achieve regenerative to design, which is a design that is positive and, you know, not just talking about um, green building, but some a positive uh, effect to the whole ecology of our planet. Then we talk about um, wellness as well, because it's important to consider um, the health of occupants inside of buildings. Because why are we designing green buildings? Uh, the main reason is because people are getting sick and obviously if we don't um, design green buildings, um, th there will be uh, consequences in terms of health. So of course, uh, the concept of health and wellness inside of buildings becomes part of this concept of green building. And there is something called a well building standard that looks at designing buildings uh, with uh, 
good air quality, water, nourishment, light, fitness, and comfort in mind. So it's not really just the physical health, but also the mental health uh, of occupants inside of buildings. And um, I believe that one of the most important obstacles for achieving sustainability is uh, the population. Uh, population growth will increase to 10 billion by 2050. So how do we manage those resources and the infrastructure of an overpopulation? And cities like Seoul uh, is what we call mega cities and that we have so many people but to share a very um, small amount of resources. How do we deal with that? And that this is not really architecture, but I think you need to know that this is one of the most um, biggest obstacles to attaining sustainability. And just to finish uh, my, my part of my presentation is that um, with global climate change and global warming, obviously the um, number of natural disasters will increase. And if we look at the data here by Munich RE, um, the number of natural disasters have increased three times, triple over the last 30 years. And um, one of the projects that I designed in particular related to uh, this project, um, this catastrophe here, uh, the Sumatra earthquake and tsunami in Indonesia, um, I developed a green building that was uh, earthquake uh, proof and developing this with uh, Nihong Seki and the arch uh, architects and engineers together. And I just wanted to show you some of the images related to the design process. And here you see I was working on this design uh, with a group of architects and engineers. And you know we have a term that we call the integrated design process. And this is something that you want to implement as soon as possible in your um, design project, which is to have a group of um, stakeholders, uh, engineers, contractors, and, and um, designers together to develop um, ideas early on. And you know, you remember that I, sh I showed you some of those slides, uh, the first slides where I said architects design first and give it to the engineer. Well, we don't want that anymore. We want the engineers to be involved in the design process early on. And th these are some of the early kind of massing models and um, uh, working with sketches with the engineers of how we would design this. And this is a university uh, and hospital project. And coming back to this concept of the termite mound, looking at um, uh, nature for inspiration, this is one of the sketches for uh, the building um, to look at how uh, natural ventilation, the air comes into the building and then it becomes warm and how it comes out uh, a chimney, uh, how it can collect um, water uh, the same way as the termite mound with evaporative cooling, you know, with the humidity and when the humidity uh, becomes water, how can we retain that water and use it and recycle that? Uh, solar panels, um, understanding the sun, the heat, the light, and how do you harvest that and use it inside of your building. And also on the facade, um, to have a screen of a green wall to filter the air, to make it clean, but also to cool it down when it comes into the building. So um, this is the final design that we finished with. As you can see, it has the elements of um, the um, the green wall and how it kind of filters the air and then this, this the, uh, the middle being a chimney and also um, uh, and also a, a solar panel um, uh, roof here. Um, so all of those ideas were kind of implemented in, in the final design. And just one thing I wanted to note here is that this was also developed with structural engineers because of earthquakes. The design here was that the whole the whole building was on a base isolation, so it's kind of like on springs and it moves 
uh, when the earthquake uh, comes. So the building can move side by side a little bit um, to sustain uh, an earthquake. Okay, so this is my part and I'm going to pass it to Trevor now to talk to you more about different techniques uh, at, from an engineering perspective to achieve uh, green building design. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, and really to follow on from some of the points that Henry was making um, about the climate. And this is in Vancouver. I think the point to say is that the climate will affect us all. And we, um, there's so much momentum in climate change, but we have to design our buildings as architects and engineers together as a way of, of dealing with that. Um, taking on those problems. Um, we can see that, you know, that a lot of flooding happens. We can see the impact of this with our technology a lot better nowadays. Um, we can see this has all, all happened in the last two or three months of the year before COVID happened, some major flooding. Parks become marshlands. The bushfires <coughs> um, of Australia, tragic, uh, this last year and um, the impacts in the town where I live in Canada with forest fires uh, also spreading across the the wilderness lands where which brings smoke into cities and affect people's health so we have to think differently and we have to act differently um, think about regenerate regeneratively. That's how we've got to act and think and practice as architects and engineers together. One of my inspirations is a, uh, a guy called Giraday, Herbert Giraday, and he looked, helped us to look at the city or a building as a metabolism, like our bodies, where we need food and energy and water and fuel and we consume it and we produce waste and this first diagram at the top is a linear metabolism that is our business as usual but to the bottom he suggests we need to think more of a circular metabolism can we make the city more efficient the building more efficient can we therefore need less inputs and can we recycle some of the waste that we produce? Other authors have also looked at this, such as Amory Lovins with Factor 4 and some of the references there that Henry referred to. So when this, what this means is that we want to look at, you know, passive systems. Passive means that they operate just naturally. They don't need to have a lot of energy or air conditioning or electrical lighting. Passive systems work in harmony with the local environment, the natural environment. So if we put a good envelope, we don't need to heat so much. If we provide shade, we don't need to air condition so much. The thermal mass of that Eastgate building and the nighttime flushing was a way to deal with uh, air conditioning. And the earth tube systems, these concrete pipes you see at the left, at the bottom, they are a method of bringing in the fresh air for ventilation and the ground can cool it down and also warm it up in the winter. And at the end of the day to have a mixed mode where buildings can operate in a closed fashion when the climate is too extreme, but for much of the year can operate with passive systems. To look at a facade, to look at the envelope. In Canada, we would typically say that 30% glass is a good number to aim for. In Korea, it may be more like 50%. Um, but we have to think about the envelope. And there's an opaque element, which is the insulation, the glass that allows the light and the views. And then maybe the 
an operable louver which can allow the fresh air to enter from outside. So here's some examples where we take this design concept and we can get the cladding made through a panel in a factory to save waste on site and to improve construction quality. And at the bottom there, it shows that we can also integrate some energy generation through solar photovoltaic systems. Another method of construction that is, has a lower impact, Henry referred to the materials. Well, the materials of concrete and steel is about 10% of global greenhouse gases. And my colleague, Veronica Madonna, and I will be talking in more detail on May 27th, which will be the 20, possibly be the 28th your time. We'll check the exact times later. But specifically to look at these mass timber structures where we use natural materials, it helps to reduce the time on site for construction and saves money. And these are tested to be strong and fireproof and earthquake proof in the same way that a steel or a concrete structure would be. They also can appear to be very beautiful. And I believe the tallest wood structure right now is around 20 to 25 stories tall. We need to also get into some more technical analysis of how does the building work. Once we've thought about the envelope and the structure, we can create a very simple energy model and this Matchbox Energy is a software that Professor Richard Croker and myself have developed. And we work with our Athabasca students using this software to do very quick energy models and test different envelopes. If anyone would like to have a trial of this for free, we just get in touch and we will give you a trial access. You can enter in different zones in a building, for example, housing, commercial office space and retail. Enter it into a model and you will gain the analysis very quickly within about 10 minutes of the carbon footprint, the energy use, the heat gains, the heat losses, the heating and cooling and ventilation. All of these will be presented to you and then you can make changes to the facade and to say, well, maybe I'll make my glass rather than 50%, I'll make it 80% because I want more glass and see the impact that that would have on your air conditioning. Um, so it's a very simple tool that we like to work with in the early days of a building design. This is an example of a, a mass timber structure with passive cooling systems such as the earth tube and the panelized construction of the facade and this was modeled using that matchbox initially we also have solar photovoltaic panels on the south elevation to generate some power so these are not just theories these are coming into practice into real commercial buildings and as henry mentioned Athabasca University is based in the center of Canada, in this town close to Edmonton, which is the capital of the province of Alberta. There's about 750,000 people. It's a cold northern climate. And we worked together with a project to redesign a brownfield site in the middle of the town, a former airport, and to create a new community. There's the former airport, which is now no longer operational. And it's very close to the downtown. Working with Peter Busby, the renowned international architect and his firm Perkins and Will, we were successful in winning the design competition to generate a new community, which would be carbon neutral and water efficient on this former airfield site. 30,000 people would live, work, play and study. 
but to be carbon neutral is quite a challenge. And we had to work out what that meant. The city said to us, this must be a carbon neutral development. Otherwise, your winning entry will not really count. So we had to look beyond the red line of our site, which is over here where my arrow is pointing, and think how can we generate clean carbon neutral energy. Our first discussions led us to the waste treatment plant of the sanitary waste and also of the landfill site where the solid waste is buried. And we found that there was a, 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 the, an unused resource. This is the sewage treatment plant and there's a lot of waste which we can use from this system and also the landfill site where waste wood and domestic goods are buried and treated. We found that the organic waste was significant and by using that combining the organic waste together we could produce a carbon neutral source of electricity and district heating which could serve the Blatchford site for 30,000 people. So from 750,000 people population, there was a surplus of waste to allow 30,000, roughly 5% of the population to live in a completely carbon neutral manner. And these are some of the machines that we would use, gas ifiers, and organic Rankine cycle engines. We can talk more about that if we have more time. But also in this part of Canada, the ground is very hot when you get deep because it's near the Rocky Mountains, a huge mountain range. And by drilling down into the earth, we can get heat and also generate power that way through a geothermal system. So together with the organic waste to energy, and the geothermal, we were able to piece these together to produce enough power, not only for our project, but for much of the downtown core of the city. And they became carbon neutral as well through these methodologies. We did re water recycling too, and we, we can uh, explain a bit more about this sometime. But this is our metabolism diagram that Giraudet was referring to and one that we like to produce. I'm going to show you one more project and this is close to Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, it's a cool coastal climate and the project we're working on here was to be net zero energy, net zero water and a biophilic design, low embodied carbon emissions as well in the materials. This is the project, it's called the Penda Harbour Ocean Discovery Station, or PODS. Jeremiah Deutscher is the architect. And it's on a small coastal inlet just outside Vancouver. It's made up of three timber grid shell structures with a total floor area of around 3,000 square metres. Each of these shells has different components, restaurant, gallery, aquarium, laboratories, museums. It's an educational building focused on the health of the ocean. M much of Canada is a big landmass far from the ocean, but the ocean uh, resource is very rich on the Atlantic and on the Pacific side, the Pacific side that we share with Korea. So this is to do with conservation. And the building itself has to be a model of conservation. The architecture, the engineering, the systems, they have to speak to that conservation of the ocean and of wildlife and of the nature and the planet. Some systems that we used, because we have a lot of sunshine in this part of the world, was to look at different glazing. And there's a product called Smart Glass which can have a tint that can be adapted depending on how bright the sunshine is. 
too much heat in a too much sun in a building generates too much heating which generates a need for air conditioning for comfort so this is an option to deal with that also the ventilation design how does the air move through this building well naturally it would be the preference to bring sea breezes through the openings and out through the rooftops so that is our plan to cool it using natural breezes but there will be times when a mechanical system will be required and for that we're looking at highly efficient systems using these earth tubes to pre-cool the air and then finally the ocean energy itself is a resource that we are hoping can be tapped into to generate electricity and also to provide a heat exchange a very low grade heat exchange which can cool the building or even warm the building in the middle of winter because the ocean is a very stable temperature and so there's different technology that is being investigated to see if that would be viable obviously the wildlife and the protection is a um, significant component in our studies on this and will only go ahead after serious environmental research so we're left with this metabolism diagram Giraudet style for the pods project and all the systems work together from the ocean energy some solar energy capturing rainwater for flushing using the natural ventilation and and embracing the landscape all of these systems have to work together and be clearly understood between the the owner the architect and the engineer and so this is the process that we're on and it can seem quite complex but by constructing these kind of sketches we hope to be able to have a better understanding together of very technical issues that can be also become simplified so that they can become educational um, resources and help with our sustainable regenerative designs. Thank you. That's all I had to say. Kasa Hamnida. And this is a note on the lecture that Veronica Madonna, my colleague at Athabasca University, and and myself will be sharing on May 27th. And you can register. Uh, we will send this to, to John as well for his information. Thank you. So John, we had left uh, some time for questions if uh, students wanted to. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you, Henry and Trevor. I think it was great. It's kind of combined very well. One was more about the general picture. And finally, Trevor entered to the design part. Some of the things were already so in my class, but in a more abstract way, let's say a little bit more dry. So when students begin to see that this is something that they apply in the design, I think it's great. So I both thank you, both of you for your presentation. And as Henry just said, there's a few minutes that we can share questions with the guest lecturers. So hopefully you have some questions. So it's your time, guys. Anyone has any question? Think about that. <laughs> Maybe you can put them in the chat box if you like. I just want to mention that um, some of my students from Athabasca are also here. Um, if, if any student from Athabasca has any questions, uh, we would welcome any questions as well. Sure, sure, anyone. Hmm. Oh, John -un? Yes. Hello, my name is John -un -o. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving us a lecture. Uh, I wonder, in most green buildings, uh, ah, 한국말로 해도 되나요? <laughs> 한국말 아니요. Just speak ah, in English 네. a little bit, please. There's <laughs> okay. the people from Canada, so. 
Okay, okay. Uh, in most green buildings, uh, various energy saving uh, in implemented to protect the environment. Understand? <laughs> okay. Uh, among them, I wonder how electricity saving workers for environmental protection. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> The electricity is, wow. is, a, is, a, is a big saver, if I understand your question right. It depends on how, what is used to generate the electricity. Is it burning natural gas or coal? Or is it using wind or cleaner sources of energy? In some parts of the world, even some parts of Canada, there's a lot of coal is still burned to generate electricity. And if you save electricity in those cities, you have a massive impact on the environment. In other places, the energy is made from hydroelectricity, from the water. And therefore, it's a very clean system. So it doesn't mean the job is finished, but it means that um, we have to continue to improve and look towards this net zero energy consumption. That's really the, the answer for every project, no matter where we are, whether our grid is clean or dirty, we have to aim towards net zero energy. So therefore we don't put any demand on our infrastructure with its emissions. Yeah, I would add also that um because of how we produce energy, Jungwon, is fossil fuels produces a lot of CO2 and a lot of pollutants into the air. So because of that, it already is um, deteriorating the natural environment for not only animal, animals, but also for people and for plants and everything, right? So what our main goal is to shift fossil fuels, and in Korea, you also have um, uh, uh, radiation from um, uh, um, your energy. So you have to think about what is the consequence of the type of energy that you're uh, producing. So in Canada, like Trevor said, we have a lot of waterfalls. You think of Niagara, right? We have a lot of waterfalls. So a lot of our energy in Canada is made from water. But water is a very clean energy compared to burning gas or burning oil because there's not so much CO2. However, even in Canada with um, hydroelectricity, water electricity, we have problems because when we have waterfalls um, and we create the dams, um, we have to think about the aquatic uh, um, uh, animals as well, like what happens to the fish when they have to swim and they go into the dam. You know, I think with the choices that we make on how we make the produce the energy, we have to think about how that um, is consequential to the um, environment um, and how that affects uh, the natural uh, ecosystem. So there's no perfect solution, but there's some that are better than others. Um, so what we want to do right now is really avoid fossil fuels first because that's affecting everything. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. And I think we have a question in the chat box. Uh, Laura is asking, what are your thoughts on using FEA, the assets reclaimed and recycled materials for design? Trevor, you want to? Could you explain what FEA -E is? Yeah, I don't know. Finite element analysis. Okay. Is this to do with the sort of strength to see how strong they would be? Uh, 
Um, I guess, you know, reclaimed and recycled materials, we have used those on different projects. Um, there's different grades of reuse, for example, the most simple is to crush glass and use it as a bedding material for paving or for landscape areas. Um, there's no, not really a structural risk to do with that. Other, other options are to reuse flooring, either, you know, use, use materials more as finishes rather than as structural again. Um, reuse furniture, reuse um, wood flooring, we've seen that in some buildings. Uh, in terms of reusing structures, that is that is possible. Um, I've worked on I think two or three buildings where steel sections have been reused, and those are obviously tested using a, a finite element analysis to to prove their strength and structural capacity. Um, you know, it's going to be it's going to be a challenge sometimes to convince a structural. I'm not a structural engineer. So uh, I can't really speak for a structural engineer, but I know that they're very um, interested in, in being part of this regenerative design discussion and have really led the way on the mass timber elements. So, you know, recycled steel structures, also using crushed uh, concrete as recycled aggregates in the concrete mix. I've worked with that on lots of projects. That seems to be a very common uh, recyclable um, and reclaimed material that's that's commonplace certainly in North America and in Europe. Anything to add Henry? No I think you answered the question that um, she typed. Okay great. Answer. Um, Joanne how are we doing on time? I know that Kim Young is always very tight uh, when we have classes one after another. I think it's okay we do have like 10 minutes more so if we have more questions, that would be great. Uh, we have one in the chat box again. Okay, great. Uh, Tanya is asking, are the green designs that Trevor was talking about, are they expensive for the building design? If there is a high upfront cost, does it recover itself over time? So Trevor, I think they're asking about the projects you're you've done. I think, um... You know, the, the payback time is really effective on how much it costs for energy from the utilities. So if you're in a place where electricity is very cheap and you're wanting to save electricity, you just look at that simple payback. Um, sometimes that's hard to, to justify. But with regulations and with our... It's more, a lot of it's driven by regulation where you have to do more green design work now. Um, you can't build the way, I don't know if you're, any of your parents were architects or family members, but what they were doing 20 years ago is not allowed anymore. And so as society, your role, you have to be a champion of green design. And that means that you have to educate your clients and the municipalities, the cities that you are working with, the owners, the, maybe the universities, to explain to them why green design is very important. It's essential, as Henry was saying, uh, to reduce, to keep this climate temperature raised to less than 1.5. Um, sometimes, you know, if you can get smart with your initial design by a really good, orientation and facade and envelope make your building form very efficient then some of these green systems um, can be included within the budget of the building because you're being wise in how you spend your budget on the building so if you're wise in how you uh, allot your your costs you can include some green technology as well yeah, maybe I'll add something to that as well, Tanya, is that whether or not green building costs more or not, um, it really depends on how, um, how much the materials cost. Uh, and for example, you know, when we talked about passive design, some of those things, for example, um, just a matter of choosing the right orientation for your building. If you have more windows towards the south, 
and you gain more sunlight, um, you know, that saves you some energy, right? And that doesn't cost anything at all, right? If you make the right passive design choices. Um, and if you design your building so that there is a way for the air to go through and it cools more efficiently, then you save um, some energy costs for air conditioning as well. So what I was trying to explain is that, well, some of those design uh, ideas does not cost more. It's just, uh, you just have to be smart and understand how air moves and how heat is gained and lost and how do you contain um, heat inside of a building, you know? So it, it's a matter of choosing the right materials, making the right shape, choosing the right direction. And that's costless. It's, it's a, if you're a good architect and you understand the context, then there's no cost at all. At the same time, there are things that cost money. For example, I, if you analyze a building and you say, do you want to put solar panels or not? And a solar panel could cost $10,000, $20,000, you know, big man won, And then how do you say that those solar panels will recover or not? You have to kind of lay it out onto your electricity costs and say, well, Every month I save 30 bucks or 50 bucks, 100 bucks. And then how long is it going to take? And if you do the calculation, when I did this course uh, four years ago, you know, when I started this course at Kemi University, I did this calculation for Korea and it took about 20 years. So if you want to install solar panels, it takes about 20 years to get the cost back of saving electricity to install those solar panels. So whether or not 20 years is reasonable or not depends on how long you do your life cycle costs. So are you thinking about in the next 10 years, your building is gonna be demolished, then it's not worth it. But if you're gonna use your building for 100 years, then it's worth it, right? So it's, it's really a matter of, of costing it, um, your building throughout a long period of time and, and really uh, making that decision there. And uh, to add one more thing is that more and more we use one product, like we talk about solar panels. Um, a lot of countries like South Korea has a lot of incentives. Government will pay you to do green building design now and, get, and pay you um, some money to save some tax or something like that. So that also comes in, you know, if you're in a country that the government supports you and gives you incentives to do green buildings, that also lowers the cost. And then if you have countries like China or India producing solar panels, it also reduces the cost a lot, you know, mass production, and you make it the new normal to use solar panels, and it'll just keep on going down, right? So it's, it's a kind of a cycle. Um, to make green buildings lower cost, we have to use it. You know, if nobody orders any solar panels, then the cost will be very expensive. So we do have a last question, maybe. And then it's Sunday night in Canada, so probably you want to be taking a rest. So Juan, is it okay? Can yeah. you, you want to speak? Okay, great. Hello. Hi. Uh, I have a question. Professor Henry said that outer wall made of glass is inefficient, right? Then what is the way to make the building greener through designing the outer wall? So maybe I'll start and I think Trevor has something to talk about as well. Is that, you know, we, you have to kind of imagine your building um, to be kind of like a jacket. You know, you want to keep, if you have air conditioning or you have heating, you want to keep the temperature in the building stable. Glass is very thin and it, it loses heat and gains heat very easily. So it's kind of like wearing a very thin jacket. You know, it's not much useful. Yeah. Um, so there's different ways to make it better. Um, there is highly efficient or more efficient glass, which is more like double or triple layers. You know, you have many, many layers of glass. It makes it more efficient, but still 
it's not as um, it, the insulation of glass is not as good as um, stone or brick or having some kind of insulation inside of your wall. So we say that in comparison, we have many, many materials. Glass tends to be the weak, one of the weaker ones. However, you know, glass is very beautiful. You know, we as architects, we like to use glass because of transparency, we can see through it and it's very beautiful. And we want to use it because we want to have the relationship with the outside. We want to see outside, we want to have the, the light. So what Trevor was talking about is that we have to have a ratio, like a percentage of how much glass is enough. You know, I think uh, Trevor was talking about in Canada, we usually say that glass should be only about 30% of the wall. Some should grow. If you have a wall, some 30% would be glass and everything else would be highly insulated with different materials. I think Korea is because you're not as cold as Canada, it can be about 50%. But if you really want to design a glass building, you have to think about um, Mo many, many layers, maybe double skin is one way is to have a double skin means two glass and have air in between um, or have glass that's relatively thick uh, and have, have it layered to contain, um, to control the, the, the um, temperature inside of the building. And I, I think Trevor would add to that. Yes, thank you, Henry uh, and Suwan. Thank you. Um, the uh, I'd mentioned some of that dynamic glass where you can alter the tint. That's very expensive, but it, so you may blow a lot of your budget on, you could have 100% glass, but expensive glass. So you have to sort of work within what the amount of money your client gives you to build with. There is technology that you can pick off the shelf to to um, help you with your design, but you should start from the basics and then work out and then see, like I was saying about the solar, think about if you start with the basic design, then you've got some more money in your pocket and you can think, where should I spend this? Um, where's the best use to make a regenerative building here? Mm -hmm. uh, a really good architectural, comfortable, healthy building that's responsible. So you know, start with the basics and then there's plenty of technology solutions. Thank you. Okay, I think this could go because the subject is so broad and so interesting, right? So, but maybe if there's no more question, we can just say thank you again to Henry and Trevor for joining us, all the students in Korea, all the students in Canada, Everyone, I think it was a nice conversation and I hope we can have some more interaction in the future. As Trevor said, there's gonna be a lecture on mass timber. So he's gonna send the details to me and I can post it also in our website. So we are also going to join if you want. And again, thank you everyone for joining. And also, if anyone would like a trial in the Matchbox Energy, I can make that available as well. Go on. That would be great. I think maybe we can share also. Try it out, yeah. So, great. Henry, Trevor, you want to say something else? <laughs> I'll just say thank you. Thank you very much for being part of today and um, the conversations that we've had. Thank you for your time and questions. Really, really nice to meet you all in this way. Thank you. And, um, I also want to say thank you. 감사합니다. Uh, 한국말 잘 못해요. <laughs> 잊어버렸어요. <laughs> I, f I lived in Korea for four years, but I forgot many of my Korean. But I, I do miss uh, Daegu and I do miss uh, Kim Young University very much, especially the Bulgot season uh, last, last month. Unfortunately, probably um, COVID-19 was not a good time to have uh, uh, pictures with the, the cherry blossoms, but I think that's one of the most beautiful uh, 
uh, memories I have of, of Kemyo University. Uh, please say hi to uh, Songyo Sunim and uh, <laughs> Bakyo Sunim and everyone at, uh, at the university. Uh, so I wish you good luck. And if you have any questions for us, um, just send us an e email and we'll also invite you to our uh, events um, at Athabasca University. And if any, any of you have a chance to come to Canada, uh, just uh, give us, um, just let us know and we would welcome you here. Yeah. Just don't come in the winter, it's very cold. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good idea. Just, if you come to Canada, I, to Korea, the best time, as Henry said, the best time is, of course, the cherry blossom. This season was very special because of the virus, but if all the students visit the campus, I'm pretty sure, even if it was kind of forbidden, everyone was taking selfies in there. So it was also a nice time, even the circumstances. Nice. So thank you, everyone. I think it's great. It's Sunday night, it's Monday morning. See you soon in another occasion. Thank you again, Henry, Trevor, and everyone everywhere. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank See you. Yeah. Okay, Sandida, thank you. Thank you.